we put the praise music first before we stream to YouTube. That way YouTube doesn't slap us for playing copyrighted music is basically what we're doing. So they tend not to, good, they tend not to be too bad, but uh, just, just to protect ourselves, we don't stream playing that music. Anyways, good morning again. Uh, I really only have two quick announcements. I don't think that there's any others coming out from you folks. Oh, Brian, you've got one. So Brian, why don't you go ahead and, and do yours and then I'll do mine. We should have let you do yours first. You may have covered mine. No, I don't no. think so. How do you know? I don't. There you go. <laughs> uh, congregational is April 9th, which is next Tuesday at 7.30. Was that That's yours? not what I was going to say. All right, then, then, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reminder for my calendar. Uh, a week Tuesday. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yep. Sure. Uh, well, I was just going to say, don't forget that there's refreshments afterwards, the light, uh, light breakfast. And, um, you know, I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, Friday's good service out of my 11 years in ministry was the best attended service for a good Friday service. We had 40, 40 people here. And I joked Thursday night at Monday Thursday, which we had 21, 22 people out, which was, uh, I, I, I think, an enjoyable service, um, um, at least from, from my perspective it was, um, that the reason why I wanted to hold Good Friday service is that even if we had 15 or 20 people, it would look full. And we had 40, so you can imagine how full. And, and just look around, We've got 31 today, so it's it's close to what we had today. Audrey. Just to add to that, Phil, Friday service with the with Friday service was without a doubt one of the most moving ones that we've ever been to. And, uh, Say that again so we can hear you. <laughs> I need to hear it twice. No. <laughs> I just wanted to say that Good Friday service. Um, was without a doubt one of the most moving services that we have gone to. Doug and I both felt really moved by it. And um, yeah, it was a very touching service for sure. Thanks, it made us think really deeply. Thanks. So, right. yeah. Yeah, thank and you. And then on a lighter note, I just wanted to say that um, we delivered the uh, prayer quilt to Bob Connor on Monday afternoon, and he's deeply appreciative of it. He just really loved it, really enjoyed it, and said, please pass my thanks on to the congregation. And um, then going back to Bob, just that he did get good news this week. Um, the chemo is working and attacking the cancer cells, apparently. So we just keep him in our prayers that that does continue for him. Great. Okay. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. Just leave it on. Leave it on. I okay. think for the scripture reader, you might as well. Um, th uh, you know, uh, yes. Oh, how old is Jim? 70. What she said. Well, happy birthday, Jim, sometime this week. Thursday. Thursday. There you go. Uh, I, I, it's kind of funny because Terry had a birthday at Odessa a couple weeks ago, and I had acknowledged it, and he said he wasn't counting. He was going backwards. So at 70, you can start going backwards, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Audrey, I just want to say thanks for, for that, uh, kind, those kind words. Um, you, I'm sweating in this man dress, and, but you've given me goosebumps, so thank you very much for that acknowledgement. I appreciate it. Uh, let's get on with our worship, shall we? Our traditional morning gathering. Welcome in the name of the Christ. On the, the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. Welcome to this place of retreat and refuge, worship and wonder. It is good to be here. My friends, it is good to be here on Easter Sunday with you. Let us prepare to worship God.
the light of Christ. The tomb is empty, the stone is rolled away. It is true. Amen. And before we do our statement of faith, I just want to acknowledge whoever's done the flowers. They're beautiful. Jen was taking pictures, and apparently about mid-row where Wilma and, and, and uh, Et, you can smell it uh, down there. So it's really good. Yeah. Our, say with me, our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in others and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And our responsive call to worship this morning. Yesterday we thought death had won. Yesterday we thought all was lost. Yesterday we thought Christ was gone but not today. Today we know that love has won. Today we know that hope is real. Today we know that Christ is here. We have a reason to hope. We have a reason to sing. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen today. Let's come together in prayer. God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people everywhere. Amen. Welcome, happy morning, Voices United 161.
the angels tell the women, remember what Jesus told you. So church, remember this. You are forgiven. You are held in God's grace. All of this, all of this is true. Grace and mercy abound for you. Remember this. Amen. beginnings on that first Easter morning, the disciples struggled to hear the good news. Doubt clouded their minds, negativity took root, and hope vanished with a simple shake of their heads. As we return to this familiar text, help us to hear differently this morning. Open our ears that we might hear the sounds of alleluias ringing through this text. Open our minds that the mystery and joy of Easter might feel within reach. Open our hearts that we might believe the unbelievable. And like Peter, in this hearing, may we move closer to you. God of the empty tomb, we are hungry for your good news. Speak to us now. With hope in our hearts, we listen and we pray. Amen. Good morning, so many people. (laughs) I'm reading from Luke 24, 1 to 12. But on the Sunday morning, very early, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared, finding that the stone had rolled away from the tomb. They went inside, but the body was not to be found. While they stood utterly at loss, all of a sudden, two men in dazzling garments were at their side. They were terrified and stood with eyes cast down. But the men said, why search among the dead for one who lives? Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee about the Son of Man, how he must be given up into the power of sinful men and be crucified. 
and must rise again on the third day. Then they recalled his words, and returning from the tomb, they reported all of this to the eleven and all the others. The women were Mary of Magdala, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and they were the other and they with other women told the apostles, but the story appeared to them to be nonsense, and they would not believe them. For the word of God, for the word of God among us, oh sorry, for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. May these, the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The title of this week's reflection uh, commentary from that resource, Sanctified Art, is and i hope that sound effect was the sound effect that we used on good friday i'm sure that was the sound that our women that linda read in scripture this morning had ringing in their ears from the day that they were there to see jesus crucified i'm sure it was a, a haunting sound for them over those three days <clears throat> as they got up that early morning before the sun had even broken the dawn or the horizon as they were going towards the tomb. I know on Friday, listening to that hammering sound was a haunting sound. In my sermon last week, I had commented on how there were times that I wished that all four congregations could come together so that you get the same message from, well, for me in, my, in this case, but just so you, you, you get it repetitively. And I had mentioned last Sunday about those who gathered on that day of, of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, how the disciples weren't aware of what was to come this week. They didn't know that they would hear the hammering sounds on the cross on that Good Friday. In fact, the disciples weren't there. It was only the women and the one to whom Jesus loved, if you know scripture. But it's hard for us to wipe away our collective memory. I think what I had said last week was that using me as the template, I'm 62, I've been going to church since I was in diapers, I'm sure, but at least until I was 10 would I have recalled the, the gospel story, knowing 50 years of hearing how it would come out. That we seem to want to gloss over Holy Week and Good Friday and go from the triumphant entry into Jerusalem to Easter Sunday and forget what happened in between. Christians seem to have a habit of doing that. But you know how the story ends. But not so much how it ends because the good news of Easter really truly never does come to an end. On that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women go to the tomb to find it empty. This is good news. But is it? And I hope, and I hope, I mean, I do wonder if the women had hope that early morning. I suspect not. I mean, scripture confirms this for us. If you read between the lines, and, and, and I know I'm a male and I don't read between the lines very well, but I can read between these lines. You see, it isn't until they go into the tomb and encounter these messengers of, of dazzling white, the, the message version of the Bible says the light is cascading off of them. It isn't until the, the two messengers relay the words to the ladies, the women there 
that they now remember Jesus' assurances, and then they returned to the disciples with the news. And it wasn't until that very moment when they remembered that they suddenly had hope. Until then, they didn't. It was hope that these women then carried with them as they went back to tell their news, the the remembering to the 11 disciples, who in their own right were grieving just as the women were when they embarked that early morning to go to the tomb. And what do the disciples say? Not just words of of disbelief, but downright dismissal. While translations render their reactions as, quote, an idle tale or uh, a foolish talk or nonsense, the real meaning of the Greek word is garbage. The women announced Jesus' promises fulfilled and the response from those three or those 11 who ought to have known better, who were the closest to Jesus is, yeah, it's a bunch of rubbish. Our 11 hadn't remembered, not like our women did, even after that they had told the 11, what the two men with this cascading light told them, the 11 just forgot. They had no hope. And Peter, you know, we've been watching, journeying with Peter during this season of Lent. Peter was among that lot, the, the 11, of course, and, and he had no hope. He was still likely reeling from his denying Christ three times before the the rooster crowed that good Friday morning. One of the commentaries I read actually said they they kind of pondered whether Peter would have run to the hills just to to hide because of denying Christ the three times or would would he have owned up to it. I just want to take a moment though and, and, and pause And I want you to consider a word, testimony. You see, a a witness who, who sees or experiences something, and then because of that experience or that seeing is moved to either write about it or to tell about it, it's a witness, it's, it's testimony. That whole sequence of, of testifiers then connects us to the witnesses. Today, I get to be fortunate enough to be testifying to you. I didn't witness it. I've heard the witness accounts, and now I can offer you a testimony. And then my hope is that you, in turn, will become testifiers yourself. You will be testifiers. Your presence here says you're testifiers, but you've got to take it out side of these four walls. That's what our women did. In their testifying, they had the potential of turning these 11 disbelievers who had no hope into people who now will become testifiers because they did not witness the tombstone being rolled away. They did not witness the the linen cloth being left there or the two messengers from God. These women, we are told that they remembered. And then these givers of testimony turned the 11 and the rest into potential testifiers. The witnesses did not convince everyone at once. After all, the good news frequently seems to be too good to be true. If the tomb is empty, if Jesus had, has been raised from the dead, then life as we know it and expected is no longer. That's what happens in that moment. The world has been turned upside down. And if the world has been turned upside down, how do we even know how to live? 
If the disciples thought that the, the resurrection was a pile of trash, what are people going to think when we confess our belief in the resurrection? And I hope. And I hope may have been the thought that Peter had in that moment of hearing when the women came and told them the messenger's message to them and that they remembered. Maybe, just maybe, he began to remember. I mean, there are times when stories are too weird to to take seriously. And sometimes the tellers of the stories are weirder yet in which case we dismiss them. In our story, however, the testimony eventually was believed. Peter and the unnamed other disciple heard, became curious, and so they went to see. And Peter saw. He saw the linen and maybe then remembered Peter was close enough to Jesus and his ministry to what mattered to now become inspired, to be amazed. And amazement is often the first step in response to testimony. Could it really be true? That's the question I'm sure Peter was asking himself as he runs with hope on his heels He ran to the tomb to see for himself. Peter, the the rock to which the church was built on, didn't have so much hope until he got there. Peter goes home from seeing the empty tomb and the linen. He doesn't get the messengers though. And he goes back in amazement, wondering what the meaning of the resurrection is. The resurrection only makes sense when we remain still, even though we know the, week, the, the yearly outcome on Easter Sunday. The resurrection only makes sense when we remain amazed, marveling and wondering at the love of God that reversed death itself. We're not asked to explain the resurrection or offer proof for that resurrection, or or make a case for resurrection. Instead, like our good friend Peter, we live in wonder and amazement for how belief in God, the God of resurrection, truly, truly can change the world. And, And I hope or as Vicki Fisher. Now, if you read the newsletter, you will know she always offers us a weekly reflection. And I got it last night as I actually was wrapping up writing this sermon. And she quotes a, a, a writer by the name of Kevin Kelly. And, and Kevin writes this, the chief prevention against getting old is to remain astonished. To remain astonished. And then she writes, oh sorry, and I think in in this sense of astonishment, it goes kind of hand in hand with having hope. Vicki writes, if you can be surprised by the sunrise, by the beauty of the first spring flower you see, by a hug from a child, then maybe you aren't really old at least according to Kevin's writing. She says, taking this attitude each and every day can potentially be filled, that each and every day can be potentially filled with wonder. There could be surprises around every corner. Rather than getting up in the morning expecting the same old, same old, what if, what if we embrace the newness of the day looked for the unexpected. And I hope. And I hope that you who have come here to gather on this Easter Sunday to remember, 
to be amazed, to be astonished, to hear the witness, and now to become testifiers to tell all of this. And thus encourage a whole new round of of witnesses and testifiers out there. Now with words of, of actions, or sorry, with words and actions under the Holy Spirit, you get to help the testimony of the unexpected good news of Easter once again ring true. And I hope. Amen. We have an affirmation of faith. Of faith. Um, it says responsive, but it's actually in unison. So say it with me. We may weep through the longest nights. We may stare at the empty tomb with more questions than answers. We may run our fingers over the burial cloths and still long for more. But today, we are people of hope. We believe in new beginnings. We believe that the God who created the world is stronger than death. We believe that Jesus abides among us, healing, teaching, and leaving fingerprints throughout the world. We believe that a tomb could not hold him. We believe that the sun does rise. We believe that Peter was there with questions, awe, and faith the size of a mustard seed. We believe that the story is not over yet, for God is among us. Today, we are a people of hope. I'm glad you can read, uh, because I certainly missed a few words in that. Our communion hymn, I'm going to invite you to stay seated for this as all who hunger, Voices United 460.
when the women got to the tomb on that Easter morning, they were met by angels who told them, he's not here, but remember what he told you. I can't help but wonder, there in that garden as the sun rose over the trees, if they remembered it all. I wonder if they remember Jesus telling the 5,000 people to sit together in the grass, passing out baskets of fish and bread. I wonder if they remembered how he ate with Zach, Zacchaeus or scooped up the children onto his knee. I wondered if they remembered him teaching in the temple, telling people, love your neighbor as yourself. I wondered if they remembered how the wind stopped with the sound of his voice. I wonder if they remembered it all. Friends, just like the women in the garden, we need those same reminders. The suffering of the world can erode the muscle memory of grace and of welcome that we hold. Don't let it. Come to the table and remember. Remember how Jesus fed everyone. Remember how none were turned away. Remember how on the night of his arrest, Jesus renewed God's covenanted promise. He took bread. Offer the blessing and broke it. And he gave thanks to those who sat at the table with him and said, take and eat. Eat it and remember me. Then at the close of the meal, he poured the cup of blessing. He raised it in thanks to God and passed it among them and said, drink this and remember me. Next slide, I think, Steve. Nope, I'm sorry. Yep, okay. God of today and tomorrow, God of the garden and the tomb, God of our faith and of our doubt, we are running toward you. Like Peter on that Easter morning, we simply cannot stay away. So with beating hearts and wide eyes, we have arrived in this sanctuary this morning, bringing with us questions, hopes, joys, and concerns. Hear these prayers as we draw closer to you, God of the dawn. We start this prayer with our hopes. Thank you for the gifts of this world that instill buoyancy in us. Thank you for the curiosity of children, for the sound of your people singing in unison, for the crowded tables and neighborly kindness, for the sun after the rain, for the spring after the frost, love after loss, faith after doubt. And like Peter, we have countless reasons to hold on to hope. Highest among them is the joy and the promise of this day. Thank you for these holy breadcrumbs on the journey of faith. However, before we found ourselves in the garden, before the joy and the alleluias of this day, we found ourselves at the foot of the cross. So for those things that erode our hope, for the things that stitch doubt and fear into our hearts, we ask for your comforting hand. Wrap your arms around all those who are still locked in that upper room. Wrap your arms around those who cannot find healing after their longest night. Wrap your arms around those who look for for reasons to hope, but cannot find those breadcrumbs amidst reasons to grieve. 
And holy God, like Peter, fan the flames of our faith. Like Peter, invite us to step out of our boats. And like Peter, use us to care for those in need, to tell your story, and to build a better world. We remember, and we believe. So with awestruck, wildly beating, grateful hearts, we now run toward you. With feet in the garden and eyes on the cross, we pray to you, saying the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, we remember. We remember that this is not the table of Trinity, Emmanuel, Riverside, or Moscow United Church, nor is it the table of the United Church of Canada. We come. We come and remember that this table is Christ's table, and there is room for you here. Come and do this in remembrance of me. What I'm going to... uh, do is invite Jen to come up. Jen and I will serve and I'm going to invite, we start at the wall and come up this way and then go around back to the seats and likewise then this section and this section and you guys will get to be last. But don't forget the last will be first. So there you go. going to invite you to do is uh, take the bread and the cup. What I'm going to do is invite you to take the bread and the cup back to where you're seated and then we'll collectively take part in the elements together. Okay.
My friends, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, the cup of blessing. Amen. You know what? Why don't I walk around and just collect them. Thanks. In this economic climate, fear is the greatest obstacle to generosity. Fear that isn't enough to go that there isn't enough to go around. What if we were to give away what we have? What if we won't be able to take care of our own needs? <clears throat> Fear is like a big stone standing between us and the experience of the resurrection miracle. So who will roll away the stone? We will through the gifts we now give. Our offering will be received and Steve, you'll probably have to play it a couple of times because it's only got one verse. <clears throat> you know come on right up join with me in our dedication god of new life we offer these gifts 
and those given through par and online, acknowledging our fear, but strengthening, stretching beyond it generosity. Thank you. Oh, Amen. Oh boy, talk about a brain worm, eh? Yeah. Thanks, Linda. I can read, you know. Are there any prayer concerns to offer this morning? Okay. Well then, let's move into our closing prayer today. Gracious and loving God, as we gather on this Easter Sunday, we come before you with hearts full of hope and anticipation. We stand in awe of the miracle of resurrection, the cornerstone of our faith, the source of our eternal hope. When we remember the women who journeyed to the tomb that first Easter morning, their hearts heavy with grief, their minds haunted by the sound of the hammer on Good Friday, like them, we too have known the weight of sorrow and the darkness of despair. Yet in the midst of their despair, they found the empty tomb and their hearts filled with hope. Lord, we confess that sometimes we struggle to hold on to hope. We are surrounded by doubt and uncertainty, and the challenges of life can often be overshadowed by the promise of your resurrection. But in the midst of our doubts, help us to remember the words of the angels at the tomb, reminding us of your promises and of your enduring love for us. We lift up to you those who, like the disciples, find it difficult to believe in the reality of your resurrection. Soften their hearts, O oh Lord. Remember their eyes, or sorry, and open their eyes to see the wonder of your love and the power of your victory over death. And may we, like the women at the tomb, become testifiers of your resurrection. Give us the courage to share our stories of faith with those others, so that they may too come to know the joy of you in new life. And Lord, we take pause to offer you the names of people and places and situations that weigh on our hearts and minds in this moment of silence. And in the good news of Easter Sunday, we offer Darren, Art, Justin, Reed, Virginia, Ellen and Nina, Gloria, Sue, Brenda, Lorraine, George, Bob, Lance, Mary Jane, Bill, Florence, Pat, Dan, Lindsay, Pat and Dan, Keith, Larry and Hazel and Natalie. And from our prayer jar, Tom McRae and Gail Delaney. And on this day, we give you thanks, Lord. Not only thanks for the resurrection of your son, but set for 70 years celebrating a birthday later this week. We offer this humbly so to your listening ear and your constant presence this day. Amen. Yep.
My beloved wanderers, as you leave this place, may, may you carry your curious hearts on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, run to the tomb, and speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart. It is I. Be not afraid. You are called. You are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting that good news. And before we close with our peace, I know someone's going to ask me to say grace. So let's say grace before we go in and continue to gather in fellowship. Heavenly One, I give you thanks for this opportunity to gather in community, to celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And I give you thanks for the hands that put the food together so we may continue in fellowship with one another. I give you thanks for the sun, the laughs, and the smiling faces this day. Amen.